Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to Sharpening Your CV for the German Market, uh, hosted by Fraser Jones, HR Talent. Uh, my name is Robert, and me and my colleague Marie are gonna provide you with some insight that we gained in our um, job experience as recruitment consultants um, about how to sharpen your CV for the German market um, and how to increase your chances of maybe getting a job interview. Uh, but first off, I wanted to give you a couple of organizational informations, uh, information uh, regarding this format. Uh, first of all, we are recording this um, because we want to provide you with the opportunity to watch it again afterwards. Um, we will um, make this available afterwards and send a follow-up mail to each and every one of you so you have the chance to watch it again and get the most important information stripped down if you want. Uh, second of all, uh, we of course um, have a chat function as it is the case with most Zoom meetings, so feel free to use that in case you have questions or you are experiencing technical difficulties. And uh, I would very much like to, to do a little test right now. So if you can see me and hear me, and you can also see the presentation, then please write yes into the chat box. That would be wonderful. I'll just take a few seconds to take a look at the chat box to see what you write. All right, Gress, great. We've got five yeses. Okay, nice, should work. Good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, over the course of this event, um, Marie and I will, of course, be looking into this chat box. Um, so if we can incorporate our answers to your questions into our delivery, we will do so. Um, but if we don't, uh, just wait for the end of the presentation. We will have like a Q&A session and a discussion afterwards. And then uh, this will be the time where you can ask your questions and we will take all the time we need to answer them. Now, before we start, one last thing. We do not claim that we are preaching gospel truths here. We do simply say that our daily business as recruitment consultants is to talk to people who write CVs and to match these CVs with vacancies that are available. And we also discuss the CVs that we get uh, with hiring managers and get their feedback. And doing, in doing this, we get some, some valuable insight that we want to share with you, hoping to help you along uh, within the process of applying. Okay, uh, just read a message from Sao Rodrigo. Uh, just one thing, there's a window. Okay, yes. Uh, it's disappeared, I think. Oh, no. Okay, it's coming, but maybe... That window, okay. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, let's see, it should not be that disturbing, but let's see how it goes. Okay. Yeah, we're on it. Um, I will try to move this away. Um, Yeah, to be honest, I will work on that once um, we do our introductory part and we can immediately start by doing the introductory part. So first off, we want to tell you who we actually are. And um, my colleague Marie is uh, going to do that first. So please people meet Marie. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So I'm uh, really happy to have you uh, today during our uh, online event. So uh, my name is Marie. I've been uh, working uh, in Germany for over three years now, and I've been with Fraser Jones for a bit more than one year and a half. Uh, my role at Fraser Jones is basically to help companies from the financial and professional services sector to find uh, their next HR employees. And I'm covering every role, so from junior to senior uh, level. <clears throat> Sorry. So as you probably already found out, I'm French. And so I am really happy to, to do this event because I know how it can feel to look for a job in a company, in a country, sorry, where you don't speak the national language. And I really hope that we will be able to give you um, some tips on how to improve your CV and also on how to present yourself. But of course, I don't want also to exclude the German native speakers who are with us um, today, because I do think this is also uh, valuable for you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Marie. Um, 
Everyone, don't be afraid. We're not ending this webinar. I'm just going to start a new screen share because I think that would solve the problem of, um, of the presentation uh, showing that window in and of itself all the time. So just wait a couple of seconds. And there we are again. All right. Uh, I'll just continue. My name is Robert. Um, I am German and my native language is also German. I have, however, been uh, doing international recruitment for uh, the past three and a half years. And um, together with uh, Marie, I would like to, to tell you some of our experience this today. Um, I've been with uh, Fraser Jones for almost a year now, which is not too long. Um, but uh, the very interesting thing about it is that um, I, I came here to Fraser Jones to um, build up the more junior end of the HR market. So businesses who are looking to hire junior candidates who are very well qualified or young professionals who are very well qualified. And um, we, we quite often experience that, of course, our customers in and of themselves are international companies, but they are especially also looking for international talent. And um, this is where we find on, on the side of the candidates, if you will, that uh, many people struggle with actually figuring out what is wanted, what is needed on the German job market in, ter in terms of how to present yourself. And that is why we came up with this format. And as Marie already mentioned, we are of course hoping to provide some, to provide some useful insight to you. But uh, speaking of useful insight, um, this is what we're gonna be covering content wise. So first um, I myself, I am going to talk about some, some essential do's so the things that we believe would help along the process of you applying effectively um, after that marie will take over in presenting some things which we would not exactly recommend in doing she will also tell you a couple of other things that might be worth considering if you haven't considered them already and uh, last but not least we will of course be looking forward to interacting with all of you to talking with all of you um, in a discussion and to answering any questions you might have. So the first thing that was would interest us, interest us, however, is you personally, why did you join this event? What do you want to take away from today? Do you have certain questions? Do you want to share opinions? Uh, please use your chat boxes for the answers. Uh, we will just, or I will just um, pause speaking for about 30 seconds to give you a couple uh, of seconds to answer that. All right, we already got the first entry, which is understanding the ATS, the applicant tracking system, how to pass it. Okay, mm -hmm. very well. Better tools and guidelines to improve my applications in Germany. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Appropriate guidance to apply for HR opportunities in Germany. Okay, very well. I'll just give it a couple more seconds and then we'll continue. Okay, so don't feel pressured right now. If you couldn't think of a specific thing to write in there, you will still ha have the chance to do that over the course of this whole webinar. And we will, of course, uh, answer each and every question or try to answer it as detailed as possible. But for now, let's dive in. What are do's? So what are things that we believe help along the process of you applying effectively? The first thing is highlight your strengths. Um, this could very well be done by you at the very top of the document that you call your CV. You could do that in the two ways that, uh, or two examples are the ways that we have um, scanned onto here. I'm sorry for the bad quality. Uh, that, that was uh, the scanning mistake. But um, as you see in the first example, 
we have an accomplished results driven L and D professional who just is writing a few lines about him or herself. And those lines provide valuable insight in everything that follows because as a, as a recruiter, as a person, you sit there and you just have to read these five lines in one word. That is not much to read. That is not, not such a big word load. Um, but at the end of these sentences, you, you will recognize while reading them, they are um, constructed in a very condensed way. They are full of important terms, um, accomplished, results driven, broad experience, coaching, designing, evaluating, training and management, development programs, and so on and so on. Uh, you could do this until the end. This is especially a nice way to introduce yourself at the very top of your CV, uh, instead of just urging someone to read through every single experience that you have listed on there. The second example we chose for this is to do basically the same thing, but to provide the information in, within bullet points. So, but it's the same principle. You want to make it as easily accessible to someone who doesn't know you and who is essentially unfamiliar with your experience and your background to get what kind of person you are, what kind of experience you have and how you, for example, um, value certain skills like as we see in the second bullet point in the second example, cross-cultural competence. Um, I will just open the, the chat box because I noticed that there were some questions coming in. Um, okay, okay, again. So one question is, do I need to highlight strengths even if I have mentioned the same in the cover letter? Um, the reason that we chose this example is that um, in, a, in a couple of companies, we know a cover letter is not always required. And um, this is a nice way to, to write this in spite of this fact. My advice in this case would be um, have a close look at, at the job ad. If the company who is advertising that vacancy requires a cover letter, then this would classically be information to be included there and then simply be uh, supported by the, the certain stations that you have in your CV. On the other hand, um, if you don't, if you are ought to not send a cover letter or if you do not send one, then this might be a nice add on just to provide a little bit more information. And as I said, if you put it at the very top of the page, then this will be the first thing that person reads and it might come in handy as an overview. I hope that answers the question. If not, let me know. So strengths to highlight. And this is, remember, for people who consider themselves young professionals or for people who want to enter the job market. It is very important to stress at this point that Companies who advertise senior positions and are looking for senior personnel expect senior level experience. Um, this is not the case with um, young professionals or people who just entered the job market. Um, the strengths that these people could highlight with, um, well, with, with most regards to any job advertisement really is of course, your qualifications in terms of your degrees um, your, theor your th theoretical knowledge, your background, your academic background, um, soft skills in, in any white collar job, uh, in any job at all. Um, soft skills are, most of the, are one of the most important skill sets to have. And um, it can't be wrong to highlight the soft skills that you have developed. Um, of course, it is important to here also be uh, realistic and to, to stick to uh, what corresponds with the job advertisement. Second to last point, point flexibility. Especially for, for bigger and international companies, flexibility is a key asset to have in pretty much any employees, but it might be uh, more expected from uh, people at the, at the junior and um, in some cases. That is not to be meant as a general statement. Um, there have just been certain cases um, that, that I was made aware of that this was the case. And last but not least, 
your motivation, your willing and your willingness to develop is really key. Because as I just said, um, for, for most uh, positions that require a lot of experience, um, this experience can only be gained over time. But um, if you as a company want to hire someone who is a, a junior in a certain segment, then you are, or companies are very likely to have the ambition to train that human resource. Um, and in order for that, it is very, very helpful if the individual at hand is motivated and willing to learn, willing to develop. And this is why this is something that you can, um, that you can very well highlight in, in your CV and in the presentation of yourself. So these are, these are a couple of ideas for you when writing your CV. A couple of you might know the feeling that you start writing it and then you erase the whole document again, start writing another part and just don't know how, how to put it all together. So um, one thing that would be a way to go about it uh, would be to first ask yourself the question, which general spectrum should um, the information in your CV cover? Um, you could do this going from macro to micro, if you will. Uh, so to first ask yourself what's, what's generally going to be in there, what defines me as a professional, and what defines me as a person. Um, going on to the micro part then would be um, which details are relevant for each element in my CV. I will go into details on to, um, concerning that in, on the next slide. But for example, one job experience, uh, if that's um, the example you choose for, uh, for the relevant details, then ask yourself what in these tasks that I did was important uh, and what was, would correspond to what is wanted in this job ad. Um, third, of course, thirdly, of course, you can and you should individualize where necessary. Um, it's important to, to look which company, uh, so what kind of company is hiring, what role is required, and what exactly it says in the job ad. Um, when in doubt, stick to the job ad. And last but not least, uh, the structure and the layout. Um, the, the experience that we often make, especially with, uh, with German employers is, and, and recruiters is that of course, like everyone else, recruiters also like to work efficiently. And if, if your, your whole workday consists of reading CVs, skimming through relevant information, um, then you are, of course, you're pretty good at filtering information, but you appreciate that it, made, that it is made easier for you in some parts um, to figure out the relevant information, to find it. So um, that would be very, very good if, if you could find a way, and I'm not saying that, that there's an ideal way for, the, for this, but um, it would be very good if one could find a way to define certain spaces for certain, maybe even categories in the CV. Uh, we will take a look at the next slide, which is a pretty good example for that. So what you see here is an example for someone who had the position of a global VP in the HR, which is of course a very senior position, but we chose the example anyways, because um, we think it is pretty well structured. First off, we see um, 14 to 15 global VPHR. In the next paragraph, we have a little bit of information about the company where this person worked. And then we have the first key point that indicates what was special about the job. Following that are the tasks that, th that this person had in their job. And last, uh, the per lastly, the person mentions what uh, exactly the achievements were, so which tasks have been fulfilled in a, in a professional manner, if you will. So one way to go about this, to be detailed but relevant, which is heavily appreciated by almost anyone who doesn't know you and wants to get an overview quickly about who you are and what you do and what you can do, is to 
say when did you do what where did you do it or which company did you do it for what was so special about that role in this case seven direct reports and you report it directly into the coo um, next the range of experience you gathered in this position and of course lastly uh, how did you fulfill or master the tasks that you were given as I said, but we can't overemphasize this, this is one way to do it. There are infinite ways to do it, but we think this, this is a very good one. And uh, with that, I would be glad to pass it over to Marie, who will tell you a little bit more on the things we think you should not exactly do. Thank you, Robert. So yeah, we are going to see now uh, the dance. So it, it's kind of... Uh, uh, taking again what Robert just said so on the information you should put so definitely not enough information is uh, is not okay <laughs> because typically on this example you so the, the last uh, experience is not explained enough so we don't know what the person was doing what position in which company and what were uh, their um, tasks and responsibilities so, of course, if you have been working in different uh, companies over the last months or even year, just mention them all, that's very important. And on the contrary, of course, too much information is not ideal because Robert also mentioned that um, recruiters will receive hundreds of CVs and uh, this might be just too much for them to, to really digest. And especially if you're in your early stage of the career, uh, we don't want to give a number, but we don't think uh, your CV should be more than three pages if you are uh, quite junior. Uh, yeah, that's what uh, we came up with. Um, we also uh, identified, uh, identified other don'ts. So that's um, the, the points where we really want to also emphasize because that's something we have experienced and all the examples we're giving uh, to you today are things we have seen. Um, so don't oversell yourself, uh, meaning if you are a young HR professional or a young professional and you have the attitude that you know it all, you can do everything, you have nothing to, to learn, etc. We don't think that's the right approach because we know that if an employer is looking for a junior person, they expect to train this person and to give, um, yeah, to give insights and to really uh, help this person develop within the company. So this is a fine line between don't overselling yourself, but also be aware of what you are capable of doing and showing that you are willing to learn. That's very important. So then it comes to the, to the next point. So don't be too passive. So typically, if you find a company or a job ad that you are really interested in, but you are not sure if some criteria are really um, mandatory. So if you, for example, are not fluent in German, but you see like your dream job, but there is this German is mandatory, nothing, you have nothing to lose to try to find who is the hiring manager and contacting them directly to really ask if this is really the case, because sometimes you will just have a standard job uh, ad and where they will not necessarily change these kind of points. But if you talk directly to the person who will take the decision, you might find out that within the business they speak English and they might find someone in the team who can do uh, all the side activities where a, a native or fluent level of German is needed. So this is really something you should do. Um, the next point is to not restrict yourself. So it depends on what stage you are at, but if you are, for example, uh, having a first interview and you think this job could be uh, really interesting for you, but you have some doubts, you're not sure because, I don't know, you have to commute over two hours per day and that's something that could refrain from accepting this job, you should express these doubts with the employer because they might have a solution and they might know what's the struggle and why if they, uh, ac they decide to offer you the job, why you would probably or you might say no. So really be transparent and uh, that's, uh, we think, the, the best um, way to, to behave towards the employer. And last but not least, uh, don't underestimate the importance of corporate culture and corporate values uh, versus your own. 
So this is maybe a more um, something on the long term, a long term version. But if uh, you are not sure of what the company is doing or you are not very convinced of the products they are selling, etc., and you go to a job interview, the, the interviewer might feel it and they might feel that there is um, a difference between what you think and your values uh, compared to the company's ones. And that's very important also because in the case you get this job, but then it's almost certain that you will not feel comfortable and you will be quite unhappy there because nothing is related to what you what you feel and what your values are so that's very important um for the next slide we want to to show you a bit of uh hints of like a few things uh, we th think you should consider so um do not forget that your cv is a precious tool this is most probably the first thing a recruiter will see and so you really need to use it as a perfect uh, platform to uh, show your strength. That's very important. So what you can do, for example, is to put yourself into the recruiter's head. So feel free to ask friends or HR peers or any other individual that could help you reading your CV and give your opinion because everybody should understand right away what you are doing. So by that, you can add some uh, key information uh, for example, if you are working in a quite small uh, HR team, we will understand quite easily that you are doing a bright uh, range of HR related tasks. And on the contrary, if you are working on a, in a bigger team, you generally speaking, you should have a quite more defined role and you should know what where your responsibilities end. So all these kind of um, points, such as also the reporting line to know where you are situated, located in the, in the environment of the company to really understand what you are do, doing on a daily basis. Um, the next point is quite common sense, but this is also good to mention that your CV should always give a clear and true presentation of, what, of your career path. So it should be chronological. Um, we rather put the working experience first and then the education because this is what uh, our clients from what we see uh, are valuing the most even though education is also important but they want to see what you are doing at the moment um, uh, I mean um, work related and then of course what kind of degrees and certificates you've got so far and this is also something that uh, Robert mentioned but the most recent experience the more elaborated it should be and I would go even farther, meaning that if any, any uh, experience should be um, justified or elaborated, if it's in line with the particular job you are applying for. So you have to make the recruiter's life easy and make yourself the connection between the job spec and your profile to show why you are the right candidate for this um, job in particular. Um, if so I I think, said, it's oh, sorry. really interesting that you mentioned this right now, Marie, because we just received a question um, mm -hmm. on like how many pages would we recommend for an individual with 14 years of experience? Yeah. So um, I don't know. Do, do you want to <laughs> say a couple things about this? So I would say generally speaking, your CV should not be more than five pages, really uh, maximum. And uh, I think from what we saw, uh, the, um, the layout where you put bullet points and you explain, brief, explain briefly what the company is doing, uh, your um, position within the company or the organization is what works best. And it's, as I said, you have to make the life of the recruiter easy and they have to understand exactly what you are doing. And the more concrete it is, the better it is. We will go a bit, uh, we will talk about this a bit later, but yeah, that's what we, we think. Okay, just as a small add on to that, things mm -hmm. that I would consider when asking myself on how elaborate one or another position might be mentioned in my CV. Um, first of all, it might be worth considering are all the 14 years spent within the same branch and within the same field. Um, for example, have you been working in HR for 14 years? Um, and another thing which could be um, good to consider when, you know, uh, limiting space for certain things to mention or not would be 
which career level are these positions on? Because obviously um, someone um, who, who has been working some kind of position 14 years ago will most likely uh, not be working the exact same position right now. And if they are, they are very, very, very senior at it, which makes them very, very valuable for that position. And that is um, a, a big part to consider when uh, structuring your CV. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so if you are, if you allow me, <laughs> I can go to the next slide <laughs> where we uh, talk about the more concretely the important information to include. Or uh, again, what we think is important to include. So I will go quite fast on the first points because it's common sense, but still, unfortunately, this is something we experience on a daily basis. But you should have your contact details uh, easily accessible. So either on the right uh, I mean, top corner or in the footers of the headers, that's, uh, that's up to you, basically. Of course, we mentioned that already, but a good description of your tasks and responsibilities. And depending on how much experience you have, I would say to elaborate the most relevant ones, but also if they are all kind of relevant, just the last three or working experience, I think it's, um, it's enough and also your achievement for every uh, relevant experience. So when I say that, uh, I mean that if you have any quantitative or qualitative data to include, please do so. Because uh, if you have, you had to uh, deal with the budget of X, Y euros, or if you uh, raise the uh, talent at, uh, retention by X, Y percent, etc., put it because it's very, uh, it, talks by itself. I mean, it's very self-explanatory and it gives a, a good idea to the, um, to the recruiter or the person who is revising or uh, reviewing your CV. Um, also, it, it's if applicable, of course, you should have a brief explanation for any gap you may have in your uh, career. So the key is just to be honest. If you were looking for a job, if you took time to um, learn some German or if you had to take care of a family member just put it you don't have to go into too much detail but there is no reason to um, to lie about this uh, sooner or later they will find out <laughs> what happened really <laughs> um, also I don't know exactly what's the audience today but one of your uh, strengths is your language skills and your cultural skills if you are not German, but you are now living in Germany, you come with a certain set, um, set of skills. And this is something you should see as a strength. Um, still, I see a lot of even native German speakers don't, who don't put their native German speaker on their CV, but just fluent or professional proficiency, etc. No, just say what's your native language and all the kind of side um, skills you have. So if you are used to working in an international environment, everything related to that is really good. So that comes with the last point where any extra information that you think is relevant for the employer should be of course included. Um, I have also an example for that. Um, if you are not native or you are not even fluent in German, but you work on a daily basis with a German team or for some things you have to review uh, German documents or for some, with some people you have to speak German, put it because at least the recruiter will think that you are capable of doing this kind of daily uh, uh, tasks and that's not a, a deal breaker because unfortunately, of course, the, the language is still very important for some companies and we personally try to also change that <laughs> because uh, there are so many good talents uh, all over the world and just because sometimes it's just a language skill that doesn't match it's very it's very it's quite a pity from really our side that's what we that's why also we try to to promote that and to always ask if german is mandatory that's really something we ask um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's it from my um, section. So we are going to see now uh, what we think you should do uh, on social media with Robert now. Thank you, Marie. And uh, before we go into that, I would yeah. briefly like to pick up two of the questions that were just posted in the chat. Yeah, of course. So uh, the first one is, is it advisable to include experience in different positions, for example, in prior experience as a teacher abroad 
or is it better to limit the information in your CV uh, to your previous, for example, positions that have been inside of HR and stick to that? Mm -hmm. um, my, my brief answer to that would be um, if, if the, core, um, the core qualifications that you need for the task at hand is the experience within HR and only the experience within HR, you should be way more elaborate. There, I think there's always a reason to mention international experience, be it exactly in the job that you are working now or in a previous one. Um, but I think it is not something that could, should consume vast spaces in, in your CV. But that's just my opinion. Marie, yeah. what, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I, I would say it really depends on the um, level of experience you have. Uh, if you are still quite junior, of course, this is something to value. Uh, and again, that's an exercise you should do. If you have either uh, a company you find interesting or if you have uh, a precise job spec, just find the common skills you find in the job spec that matches this uh, uh, specific um, experience. So I don't know if uh, they ask for English uh, speakers uh, on a very fluent level, you can use that, that you were able to teach um, some um, students, etc. or they ask if you, you have to be resilient to work under stress, you, you have to just find the skills that are compatible because every experience is important for yourself and you have to just show why this experience um, is actually an asset for them. But again, if you have 10 years of experience in a chart, that might not be the, the experience you will uh, elaborate the most. But if you are still quite junior, this is definitely something to, to value. And especially, I mean, don't remove it because we need to always keep this clear and chronological way and you should not have any gaps that are not justified. Yeah. Okay, speaking of uh, justified gaps, Marie, the, the next yeah. question plays into, into that exact same thing. So uh, the question was, any suggestion on how to depict the gap due to COVID to this situation right now, especially uh, with like interviews or offers that have been pulled back um, because people might be fearing that mm -hmm one could get the experience just from reading their CV that they haven't worked at all. So how can this scenario be explained? In a cover letter or in a CV, is it, is it required? Uh, so sorry, I'm reading again. So any <laughs> <laughs> You can go ahead, of course, yes. if you have a... I, I just go ahead then. So yeah. um, in that case, I, I would uh, personally recommend that um, you, you search for some way or form to be able to explain that. That is That might not be in paper, but in a real conversation. Of course, I know the trick is to get to the point where you can have that conversation. That is why I personally would recommend to, um, to pick up the phone uh, and inform yourself prior to sending your application. Uh, we will talk about this a little bit um, later on. That is why I just want to mention it briefly, but it is sensible, not only with regards to this, but also with, other, with regards to other things to put yourself in the recruiter's head before you send your application. Yeah. Um, and I think it anything else than to handle this global pandemic, COVID-19, very, very openly and completely transparently um, is, is exactly what, what you should do. I mean, everyone in the world is aware of this situation and yeah. I don't think there's a single person in the world that would would judge your TV CV more negatively uh, if you say that uh, that an offer has been pulled back during COVID-19. Yeah, I would say I mean again I would be honest uh, I would just maybe explain the reason why my last experience uh, has ended so if you got laid off because of corona if the contract was uh, came to an end etc and then I would just put a period where you're like um, actively uh, involved in processes recruiting processes but uh, um, given the current sanitary um, situation um, yeah, things didn't go as planned or not like this, but I would say something that COVID-19 had an impact on that and that you are still looking, of course, and you are uh, actively, yeah, actively involved in processes uh, and the uh, interview processes. And uh, yeah, I would just, uh, I would just mention because it's nothing to be ashamed of and uh, it's, I'm very sorry to hear that, but 
you should just be honest on that and companies know what's going on. So yeah, I would just keep play the honest key here. Yeah, same here. So um, just to, to pick up one other question that was also uh, written in the, in the chat box. Um, do you not limit your own chance, chances of getting a job if you mention your concerns very, very openly? And uh, of course, the brief answer to this might be yes. But um, I think that, is, that it is worth considering that, that this is a two-way street, um, first yeah. of all. And um, <clears throat> second of all, there are certain worries that an individual can have when applying for a job that are not going to go away. Um, I personally, I have worked a job where I had to commute two hours and 15 minutes one way, so twice a day. Um, and I knew that when I applied for the job, but I ignored it. And that was one of the very, the very things that made me quit this job. Um, and so you could say that it came back to haunt me. And I should have been more transparent about this uh, in, in my application process, because I later on found out that there were other colleagues who had applied for that same position and who always had to commute a long way, but they had spoken about this problem and then um, someone got uh, a refunding of their um, public transportation tickets and another one got a company car. Uh, not mm -hmm. me, I didn't say anything. That's yeah. where I would um, recommend to be transparent, even though it might limit your chance. Mm, yeah, and I mean, I would say this, uh, I mean, I can, you can call, I would say even before applying, you could call to ask uh, directly if this is something where there is a margin of negotiation, but this is, this is definitely what you have to ask for the first interview, because the first is the interview is, of course, you have to uh, sell yourself, etc. But the company also has to show you why you should uh, join them. And it's uh, it's still this game where you also have, of course, uh, the right to say, okay, there is a way to say it. Of course, don't say, okay, if I cannot work from home, I'm not interested or something, but just ask and be honest because so many times, because we work with clients and so many times, we have seen the disappointment from the client side because a candidate was always uh, up for the next stage interview. They were always telling us they were super interested, etc. And then they kept for the last stage. Oh, actually, yeah, I think it's too far away. Or oh, the salary is not that good. And while the employer was convinced they would have this person and they would have appreciated to know this from the beginning. So this is you have to see this as an open conversation at the beginning. Of course, be politically correct, but there is nothing wrong asking, is there a possibility to work from home? Also, given the current situation, or is there any possibility yeah, to, I don't know, to work part-time or to negotiate some things, etc. Just ask. If they say no, then you know the answer and you know you are then uh, able to take a decision and to decide whether or not you want to proceed further with them. But also it gives them the chance to know, okay, this might be something we should work on because a lot of candidates tell us the same and that's why maybe we're struggling um, to, to find someone. So that's a kind of win-win situation. Yeah, and just two three more points to, to add to that. The first point would be that we as recruiters, as Marie just said, in, in basic, the very basis of, um, of conversations and communications that are um, broadly enjoyed by people is open communication. And that is something that, that I personally and that, that we as recruiters are very thankful for, that we, um, that we get information from people and people open up and trust us with certain information. And it might be that in certain cases, this information need, leads to a certain person not being the perfect match for a certain um, job ad or a vacancy. Um, but that makes the person in and of themselves all the more likable to know that you have someone honest in front of you. And uh, that, that will do, I think, a lot for, for the communication the next time round. Um, yeah, yeah. And I want to also, that's something I saw, uh, you might not be good for this specific role, 
but always keep good relationship with clients you you meet because you never know maybe in six months they have the dream job and if they have a bad experience with you they will never call you back that's something we have seen where the person was very good for this new job but because they didn't like her personality or the way she behaved that she was not really honest etc they didn't consider this person so always think on the long term on the long term maybe right now it doesn't work out but maybe you will have to reapply again or to just contact this person again and you have to leave them with a nice um, impression about yourself and just one final thing you don't always have to give a statement that is an ultimatum if it comes to something that is worth negotiating try the soft approach in negotiating as marie just said ask in the first instant is there the possibility to do this and that no there is not why do you ask well because i would have appreciated that but okay now that it is not i have to make a decision but that very conversation could also be in a, in a totally be engaged in a totally different tone with you asking is there the possibility of this and that benefit for me and your potential future employer might be like yes of course let's discuss and then mm -hmm you would have a, a very um, eye level conversation, which is always great. And both parties would value the honesty that they would get from each other. And that, that, is, that is a very, very good um, factor to have an application process as in any end interaction, of course. Um, okay. One more thing we would like to let you know is um, of course, nowadays recruiting is very much done on social media and in, in Germany one of the two most common channels to, of doing this is, uh, <clears throat> are named Zing and LinkedIn. So if you are someone who's not a German native speaker who might be considering taking on a job in Germany or looking for a job in Germany right now, uh, not being used to this platform Zing um, we would recommend creating a profile there and, and using it. It is not as um, broadly spread as LinkedIn around the world, but it is a factor recruiters use on, on the German job market, as is, of course, LinkedIn. And um, one thing that maybe not all of you are familiar with yet, um, you can not only follow or unfollow certain hashtags on LinkedIn, you could also in incorporate hashtags into your profile. Um, people that I've been in contact with have had the hashtag open to work within their profile, for example. And this is, of course, something that can increase the chances of you getting found by someone who is, for example, doing active sourcing and finding you by themselves without you even being aware of a vacancy somewhere. Secondly, make sure every information on social media is correct and up to date. Because if you present yourself in a public space, then just have an eye on, on uh, the quality and the focus of the presentation, of course. Everything that is very up to date represents the most of what you are today and gives you the most benefit for the things that, that you want, of course. Um, then we would like to urge you to have a quick look at the, the first couple of search results that pop up when you type your name on Google. Are you, for example, shown with your LinkedIn profile? Does someone um, have, have access to this, um, to your profile? Um, this is something that you can, of course, um, decide on when choosing the settings, and that is totally up to you, but it might be worth checking that out. And the last point, be active. And this is a really important point. Um, I know people who have over two or 3,000 contacts on LinkedIn, and they get absolutely nothing out of LinkedIn. No, no networking effect. And that is hugely due to the part that they do not really interact with people. They do not comment, they do not post things. Um, they do not uh, follow any activity that makes their profile visible. By the way, um, generally speaking, one could say that um, more activity on LinkedIn also urges the, the algorithm to bring you up uh, at an at a earlier stage in certain searches. But that is another topic in, in and of itself, and I'm not an, act, uh, an, an expert on LinkedIn algorithms, so I'm not going to be going into details in this. But uh, the thing is that, and that is something that we experience every day, 
the more you interact, the more you applaud people for doing something, congratulate people to their new positions or to birthdays. Um, out of these simple acts of kindness, there can be um, broad conversations that come out of that. And you never know, as Marie just said, you never know what someone has to offer or what you have to offer someone. And that is why you should take these chances uh, with the usage of smartphones, PCs and tablets today. That is very, very easy for us all to do. And the last point that we wanted to make to those of you who are actively seeking a job right now, take action. First of all, create or update your social media accounts. We just uh, elaborated a little one, a little more on why we think this is important. Uh, second of all, if you find an open vacancy, um, try to find out who the hiring manager is. And if you can even get a phone number or a mail address, try to get in contact with that person. Put your name into the heads of people. Thirdly, um, well, I, <laughs> sorry, I uh, mentioned this already, but another thing which you can find out when calling someone, and this especially um, with regards to uh, language skills. So if you are applying as an international employer, uh, employee on the German job market and you don't speak German fluently, then read the job ad really closely. And if it doesn't say that German is absolutely mandatory and no application is going to be going through that is not uh, a German native speaker behind it, then call to find out where the threshold is and if it makes sense for you to apply. Um, yeah, and because I, I want to add something on that. Sometimes it's simple as, as simple as that, but the person, the first person who will read your, uh, your CV has uh, some um, instructions. It's like the first gate and they will just screen and they will kind of tick boxes. So they are not the ones who will necessarily know what is really needed for this role. And that's why we think it's really crucial that you find, or at least you try to find who is the decision maker or you find any managers who can give you this information because the person uh, maybe usually I don't say it's always the case but maybe it might be a more junior person who will do the first screening of candidates and they will just uh, filter this way you don't speak German you are out even if you have the great perfect um, profile for that just because you are not um, uh, you are not um, yeah, you don't speak German, basically you are out directly. So just try to call and to really find out if it's mandatory. So one more point that uh, also plays into that, because what you do with that in, in getting with getting in touch with people, even before you apply and before they have your professional profile and your professional life in front of them, is you personalize, you individualize yourself. Um, and, and you make your name ring a bell, if you will. So this is something that also in, increases in our experience, the likelihood of uh, having success, especially in that, in that first round, um, a CV that is tailored to a certain position. And um, if, um, if, if wanted or if not um, explicitly forbidden in the job ad or un declared unwanted, motivation letter can do very good things for you. If you do not get feedback within a few days, actively ask for it. Um, we would like to urge you to do that. Um, the, the feedback that we get from many people who are applying these days is that um, the biggest cause of unhappiness or of a, of a bad candidate experience in application processes is not that you don't get the job it is that you don't get feedback and that you are pretty much uh, left with the feeling that you're hung up to dry. You're, you're waiting for, for something that might never come. And that is why you can, it lies within your power to ask for that feedback. That doesn't mean that you're going to get it in every case, but you can, everything, you can do everything in your power. You can write an email saying, I sent you my application and I would be very happy if you could answer me really quickly. If, this application is still being considered for the job at hand or not. Because this is also a thing that would lead you to prioritize in your further actions concerning applications. 
So this is not only um, like being able to, to exercise a certain right to experience transparency if you value it yourself, it's just uh, the, the logical thing to do. Second to last point, include your availability um, to start a new job and to arrange an interview in, into your application. This is something that most recruiters will ask you in the first telephone interview or personal meeting. When would you be able to start here? Because a company always has, uh, or for the most part, has uh, in mind when they would want you to start, when they could make it possible for you to start. Um, and also, um, the first thing that I always ask myself if I read a CV uh, where I think, wow, this is a perfect match for that position. I'm really excited to talk to that, to that candidate, but um, if, if this person uh, is still interested in that vacancy, I need to ask that person when they can make themselves available for an interview because I know as soon as the hiring manager sees that CV, they will want to interview them. Um, and this is another thing where you can proactively make life easier for all parties involved by saying, well, on Thursday afternoons from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., I am not available for interviews. However, on Mondays to Wednesdays, uh, between 1 and 5, I am. Um, and the last point on this slide is do include salary expectations and required documents. Uh, this is a little bit of a sensitive point. Um, I know um, it's not um, always the intrinsical motivation to write a number of an expected salary into the application, and you by no means have to. Um, it, however, doesn't change the fact that you probably have a worth of mo a money's worth in your head that you want to be working for, and the company most likely has a budget of what is paid at the maximum for that. And this is simply something that has to be talked about. Um, our advice in this case is read the job ad carefully. Because in many job ads that you see nowadays, you can read on the, on, in the bottom right or in the bottom left corner that please send your documents like your CV and a cover letter or this and that, including your earliest start date and including your salary expectations. And if the company, your potential employer, urges you to, to do that, um, then I don't really see any reason why you should refrain from that. Because as we've said before, it's a matter of transparency. Everyone will lie their cards on the table and everyone will be open about it. That doesn't mean that you have to be uh, mentioning a number that is non-negotiable. You could put that in brackets in behind the number. That is no problem. But uh, that would serve everybody well because everybody have like would have a, a general way uh, to orient themselves to orientate themselves on. We have a question, uh, Robert. So, uh, as a recruiter, at what stage of the interview process does a candidate know he or she has a chance of getting uh, the job? First, second, or third? So this is actually a good thing to ask to already know uh, what's the interview process like to know how many stages you have. Uh, that's also give you a visibility and a better understanding of how fast they might be or uh, yeah, or who, uh, what uh, key stakeholder you will meet. But I think you can never be sure until you get the contract, unfortunately. I don't think the first. It, it really depends also on the volume of candidates they have, but it's really until the, the last stage because you can see the last stage as a formality, but there are so many things you cannot um, um, plan. And there are also, of course, this personal uh, opinion. So if you are going to meet the, the managing director as a last step and he doesn't really get along with you, even though uh, you passed all the, the other steps, you might not get the job. So. I will, myself, I will never say you, you have the job for sure uh, until you get the offer, really. However, as long as you are involved and as long as you are kept involved in the recruiting process, you do have a chance. Um, of course. Of course, um, you, you might not be able to realistically estimate how big an 
for example, in a percentage number that chances, but you do have the chance. And um, the, the more uh, relevant question in, in this case is if you want to use that information, for example, to prioritize your application processes that are going on simultaneously, for example, um, as Marie said, ask about how many steps are there within this application process? Am I very far away from the goal of getting hired here or is it just one more step? Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, that might be a good help. Uh, so we just got one other question, Marie, and I would briefly like to discuss that. The question yeah. is, how important is it to submit documents in German translation, for example, educational documents? Um, well, how did you do that, Marie? So I never translated anything. Um, so in Germany, I've been I've worked for two employers. So before uh, Fraser Jones, I had another um, employer, and it was an American one. So English was anyway the business language, and they didn't need any uh, document from my side translated into German. And I think in any any way, if you are going to so the person who put this, you will most probably apply for a company that has at least an international aspect or does speak English. So I do not see um, um, the point. If at least it's in English, uh, I will not uh, translate. And again, this is something you can ask them, as simple as that. But myself, I've never had to uh, translate anything. Okay, thank you, Marie. <laughs> no problem. Well, we are um, so far, we are through with the things that we essentially wanted to share with you. And if you should um, want to ask uh, any questions at all, then please do so now. Uh, use, use the chat box for that. We will do our best to answer these questions. But as you might have noticed from our answers until now, there is um, only so much we could provide you with because we don't have um, very much information about you as a person right now, about your CV, about your history and about your situation. So our offer is that if you have questions that could be rather dis discussed um, be between uh, two pairs of eyes in a confidential setting uh, where no one else is, is aware of that, then you may very well do that with us. Uh, we offer that to you, um, that, that we answer your questions very, very individually in another setting. Uh, of course, in this format, we want to keep an eye on um, answering those questions that are relevant for, for everybody, that everybody can uh, take something away from. And there, one question from the very beginning just comes to mind. Um, like, how do you get past the ATS? How do you get past the applicant tracking system? And in in most instances, um, this this is um, very much dependable on on the ATS it's, it's, itself. But um, the thing you can, of course, always try. Uh, this is a is a thing that I talked to a couple of people about, and they have been successful in doing that. Um, is keyword usage. So, um, of of course, always. Um, having this, this ground rule that you only apply for jobs that you are um, really qualified for, then it might make sense to get through the first instance of uh, the ATS by using certain keywords that really stick to the text that is written in the job ad. Um, and right now we have another question. Do you recommend Europass for German CV creation? I would not and so we have um, so when we work with a client we are the middleman if you like between the candidates and uh, our clients so we have a role of doing the first screening etc to be sure that uh, the candidates we're presenting to our clients are uh, ticking these famous boxes but also to it's our also our task to promote them and to show that if they are not uh, uh, complying uh, fully to the job spec that we want to show them why we think they are good. Uh, we don't, we send our own template and it's nothing related to Europass and I've very never seen anyone using it. 
it's not super user friendly i would say i used to use it in the past but it's it's not a tool that you can um remodel the way you want and it's not very yeah, i would say user friendly so it's not if you prefer this way do it but it's not definitely not something um most companies use in my opinion okay well i guess uh that's it with the uh, with the questions for now that's why i will just go one slide further and in case you have questions please continue writing them uh, i'd say we'd, we'd give uh, all ourselves a couple of more minutes but um what you see on this very last slide uh, is the contact from marie and me after this webinar you will all get access to this recording and you will all get a little follow-up mail with uh, like a top 10 list of five do's and five don'ts uh, that we talked about here and of course the the very important thing here is that you will all have the possibility to call or write either marie or me and um well with with that information uh, i will just take another last look into the chat box but i think for now we have no new questions uh that just leaves me with a with a couple of more things to say i'd like first of all to thank all of you for joining and uh for for being so interactive with us um and i sorry i don't know why this went back <laughs> now we are on the on the right slide again um i've had very much fun doing this and uh, that of course brings me to thanking one other essential person for this whole event. Thank you, Marie, for doing this with me. It has been a yeah. pleasure. It was a pleasure for me as well. And um, yeah, I hope we, we could uh, provide you with some useful tips. And uh, yeah, the, the questions very, were very interesting. And uh, yeah, of course, feel free to, to reach out to us if you have any questions. And also, you can find us on LinkedIn easily. <laughs> OK, great. And with that, just one more wish, wish for all of you. Uh, Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, have a great evening. Yeah, have a nice evening. Bye, everyone.